You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Hey everyone, before I get to the interview with Calvin, I want to introduce you to the new affiliate of our podcast, which is Jason Brubaker at Filmmaking Stuff. Jason has a great product now. It's the How to Sell Your Movie Kit, and it goes from uh, everything from beginning to end, everything you're going to need to know to how to actually sell your movie. If you're interested, he's actually running a sale now for the next three days. The link is in the show notes. You can't miss it. And if you want to go check out Jason's stuff, it's howtosellyourmovie.com to find out his Tennessee so movie kit. If you do buy from there, please let him know that you that you heard about him through us. Uh, he runs a, another site called uh, FilmmakingStuff.com, and he even hosts his own podcast as well. So he's a really great guy. If you if you have the chance, check out all, all of his great products. And everyone also want to say thank you very much for subscribing on iTunes. Um, I constantly see the iTunes counter going up. If you enjoy any of the podcasts, please leave us uh, a, a, a rating, and please you know if you could make a comment or two. Um, um, that really helps us out as well. I have a lot of great guests coming up, and you know it's just always good to get that traction out there. And if you ever want to contact me, just go to my contact page on my website, DaveBullis.com, and feel free to contact me anytime. Um, okay, let's get to the podcast with Calvin. <laughs> Uh, joining me today on another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast is Calvin Starnes. Uh, Calvin was recently an AD and grip in the film industry, but today he's a screenwriter who just last year made his first sale. Calvin, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you doing today, Dave? Uh, pretty good, thank you. Uh, you know, Calvin, just to get started, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, you know how you got started in the uh, film industry? <laughs> Yeah, I um, kind of got here by accident. I uh, went to school in Boston College and uh, needed a class one year. And I uh, was like, oh, I'll take this film class. And uh took it, and that was about the extent of it. And then decided to stay in Boston that summer. My mom's like, well, if you're going to stay there, you, you need to get a job. What are you going to be your major? And what are you going to do? And just to shut her up, I kind of was like, uh, I want to do film. She's like, well, you need to go get a film job. So I'm like, shit, now what am I going to do? So got a job at the Coolidge Corner Art House Theater and uh, met a producer who came in with the first Russian U.S. Uh, cooperative film. This was right after the wall came down. And uh, from there, got my first PA job, and it just sort of snowballed from there. Cool. Um, so you, 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 interesting how you, you come out here by how you came out to LA by accident. Um, you know, it's just always interesting to me to always hear everyone's background of how they actually got into the film industry. Because if you ask a hundred people, you get a hundred completely different answers. I found. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people. It's what they always wanted to do. Or it was a family member. It was. Uh, like some people just stumbled into it, like oh, it was a job, and they needed a guy that day, and I happened to be standing there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it you know it, it's it's kind of funny how you hear all these different stories. Um, so you know, speaking of which, you know, how did you you know sort of get to start working as an assistant director? Uh, you know, it, it, when uh, I know that's how you basically started out. Um, so when I was working in Boston, I just. <laughs> Uh, you start out, you know, doing whatever you can do, generally PA work. Um, and I just started working on student films and low budget films. And at that level, you can pretty much pick any job you want because nobody knows what the hell they're doing. So at some point, someone along the way was like, you should AD this. And I said, sure. What does an AD do? And, uh, so started doing it a little bit in Boston. And then, um, there was a movie done with, uh, uh, an AD from LA and he came out to Boston and I was his second. So when I finally moved out to California, I called him and he was my first job. 
and sort of just started doing a series of low budget movies out here in LA. You know, that, that's a good point you brought up that when you do do student films, nobody really does know what they're doing. So you could pick any job you want to. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been asked a number of times, like, how do you break in? How do you break in? And I mean, that is quite honestly one of the best ways to break in and below the line is you just have to work on everything. I mean, you're not going to make a lot of money and it's, it's you know, someone starting at 40 versus 20 has got a much harder road, but it's, it's the best way to figure out what you want to do or maybe realize, oh my God, this is horrible. I don't want to do this at all or start in one craft like camera and then maybe, yeah, camera's not for me. You know, I'm try the art department. It's a, it's a real great opportunity to just really find your way and see what you like and what you don't like. So, you know, so what are some of the more memorable experiences you have in as, a, as an assistant director? Um, <laughs> well, they're all kind of bad stories and I can't really say without dropping names, but it's, uh, it's you know, it's, <laughs> there's a lot of colorful celebrities out there. We'll just say that. And some of the things you have to do to deal with them, whether they're ornery for whatever reason, because they're on a low budget movie and they don't want to be there and they feel like they're, it's too, they're too good for the project or their career's on the decline, or you have a cast member who's has a substance abuse problem. Um, most of the stories are born out of like some drama that went down. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question. No, no, no problem. Uh, so, you know, I know based on your on your website, you said that you did eventually decide you wanted to leave assistant directing and you wanted to go into working as a grip um, because you were basically on the verge of committing a murder suicide. So, uh, so you know, uh, you know, you know, tell us, you know, take us through that transition where you basically said, you know what, I wanted to become a grip and, and, you know, how you eventually got into the, into that, uh, that specific, uh, you know, specific industry job. Sure. Uh, there's two ways to, so the, the, the end goal for being in, well, not the end goal, but a goal of being an AD is getting into the DGA. You can do that two ways is one of which is doing the DGA training program. The other way is by accumulating days, which you support with documentation, of pay stubs and call sheets and production reports and it's this whole big thing. And I went was going that route. To do that route, you're working all the low budget and like non union shows, and it's a struggle because you're just you're constantly up against these same cutting corners type things. Like, why do we need a location department? Why do we need transpo? And it's like you keep having to teach these producers like, well, this is why. So eventually, I just couldn't take it anymore. And right around that. Time, they offered me a job to go to the Philippines as a first AD to shoot a movie called Blood Surf. <laughs> and uh, they have since made the movie, but they made it without me. Um, they weren't going to let me bring anybody. It was going to be an all Filipino crew, and I'm sure they're delightful down there. But I'm like, you know, I, as an AD, you need your people. Um, so right at the same time, I had a friend who was doing uh, Bread and Roses, uh, was prepping. And he's like, hey, the movie's going to flip guaranteed. Do you want to get on it? And you can get your days as a grip. I was like, sure, more money, less responsibility. Sign me up. <laughs> and that's and I never AD'd another day after that. So you know, uh, while, while you know you have a very, lot of very good things to say about you know the the, the experience of being a grip, um, you know you said it's like the, you know the coolest department. So you know, is there any like sort of you know stories you have like uh, you know about being a grip that you could share very quickly? Um, one of the something asked me the other day was one of the coolest movies that I ever did was Terminator Three. Um, arguably not a very good movie. Sorry, John Mostow and everybody else involved. Um, but uh, the, we got to work on that. We did the second unit, which was, if you recall the movie, was that entire chase through downtown with the champion crane, motorcycle, and the ambulances. And we shot that for like two months. And um, what you saw on the final screen was nowhere near the footage we shot. Um, but it was cool. It was just, you know, every day was coming up with new car rigs and crane rigs and just, just rigging. And that's really the time when you get to stretch your brain. I mean, the day-to-day -day set work on a show like Parks and Rec or Scrubs or even a larger show like, you know, CSI, it's, it's the same stuff over and over again. It's, it's over 
overheads and 12 by 12s and 20 by 20s outside. It's flags and C stands inside. It's just, you know, becomes a bit menial. Um, another really fun movie we did was uh, Paul. It was, it was a hard movie, but it was just a really great experience to shut that in New Mexico. Just a lot of really amazing locations and just a lot of big lighting and big stuff. And, uh, um, I think one of the greatest things about being below the line, and, and maybe even this might be the only upside to incentives, because I'm not a proponent of them, but it 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 uh, allowing you to travel and you get to see things that you would maybe never get to see or as a civilian never get to have access to. Um, as an AD, I did a movie called Nevada, and we got to get really into areas of the Hoover Dam, which was amazing. Um, you just that's one of the the really great thing that I always treasure about being below the line is just being able to see things that a lot of people might not get to see. Yeah, and it's very cool. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I have friends who do all different jobs, too, in the film industry. And, you know, some of the, some of the cool things that they, you know, e- I think each one has its own sort of pros and cons. And, but you know, some of the things that they've gotten to do or see, or, and even on films that haven't come to fruition, you know, um, ha- have been amazing for them. Um, you yeah. know, you know, they've, they've, you know, uh, you know, built sets and then, oh, we, you know, either don't need these or, you know, but still it was really cool. I mean, um, I can't show you obviously cause it's a podcast, but there's some really cool, you know, photos that I have of sets that they, you know, they've built and stuff. And, and, you know, look like you just said locations they've got to visit that are, you know, absolutely phenomenal. So, yeah. you, so, you know, you eventually, you created the mystery grip Twitter. And I just want to, I, I just want to ask you, you know, there's so many mystery accounts out there, and I'm always wondering if, if some of these people are actually like – there's like mystery producer, and I'm like, is this person really a producer or are they just you know, some, some dude in Ohio or something that doesn't, you know, doesn't have anything to do with the film business? And um, you know, So I want to ask you, you know, why did you create the Mystery Grip account, and, and you know, do you often you know, see all some, of these, some of these mystery accounts and wonder who the hell they are too, like if they really are any way connected to what they say they are? Uh, well, I'll answer that one first. Um, quite a number of them are real. Um, I've met, I've met several of them. Um, I don't know if you saw my little Twitter outburst the other night, but some of them I know for a fact aren't real. Um, some I suspect aren't real. Uh, it's, you know, for a while I was very much message over messenger, but the more I began to think about it, it was very, I don't know, disingenuous and uh, almost disrespectful for the people who do do those jobs. Um, if those Twitter accounts do come out one day and go, look, here's me, I'm really this person, then I'll be the first in line to apologize. But um, I think with the mystery accounts also, it's, you know, take them with a grain of salt. There's some accounts that are very obviously real, and they put out like nice nuts and bolts uh, uh, information about Hollywood or below the line stuff. Or, um, but yeah, that's definitely before you go act on some bit of advice that some mystery account gives you, you should definitely take a moment to try and really think of this. This is the best course of action for me. I think a lot of people is almost like this hero worship for some of the accounts, and it's sort of like, hey, you know, could could be a great source of inspiration, but at the same time, just take it, uh, you know, just look a little deeper, I guess. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just I was just agreeing with you. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, I created the account um, for all of the wrong reasons. I uh, just saw that there was like this little mystery thing brewing, and I was like, "Ooh, I want to get on this. I want to. I want to be cool." And uh, so I got the account, and I just kind of squatted on it for a month or two. I didn't even know what to do with it. And then uh, one day in late December of 2013, Jesus. Um, one of the actors was late on our show and it just sort of this entire career's worth of actors making me wait bubbled to the surface. And I was like, Oh my God, this is it. This is what we've been training for. This is what the accounts for. So my first series of tweets was just like a rant on actors and what I, what I wish they would do um, for us, you know, just be on time and know your lines and do this, you know, don't be the negative thing, this negative stereotypes that you sometimes are. And, um, 
but it was fun. I mean, the account just kind of evolved. I never knew that it would become what it became and just sort of, I don't know. I think it started off from a very bad place and then maybe evolved into a, a good thing. Like I've made a lot of friends and I try and give back into the community where I can. And, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I love that I did it and I'm happy that I'm out now. It was a nice thing to be mysterious for a while, but now I'm just me. Yeah. You know, um, just going back to what you were saying. Yeah. I, I know. I, that's why with all these mystery accounts, I always sort of, I, you know, I, and you, you've met people like this where they're very good with buzzwords, you know, and you know, it, that's how they sort of BS their way through conversations. That's why a lot of these mystery accounts, I'm always like a little leery about certain things. Um, but other ones like yours, I, I was like, this guy knows what he's talking about. Um, because he just seems to absolutely know things that have come up on set or, you know, just, just, you know, film, film ministry, you know, uh, in the film industry in general, but um, but you know, I, it's it, it's kind of cool though that, that you actually sort of I don't want to say came out of the closet, obviously, but it's good to record that it's 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 cool that you actually you know you came out and you said this is you know I'm Calvin and you know uh, hey what's up because I I, I I hope maybe a lot of them will. Maybe some of them will still will still be this you know keep will still be mystery people um, because I do I would really like to know at some point some of them because I, I I remember the first time one of them followed me and I was like what the hell is this and then I now now I see there's an entire community of mystery script reader mystery screenwriter mystery producer mystery actor actress. Um, so I I hope it's not like one person just running, you know running all these accounts and um because uh, somebody was once telling me that some of these accounts not more so the ones in the film industry but other ones um, mm-hmm. are actually used are, are are being used um to monetize and they're monetizing their tweets and everything else because once they've got a fan base now and you just, again you don't even know who who you're selling who who you're being sold by to, who are you being sold to but now and it's kind of like well. You know, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just interesting. Um, but who knows? Maybe we will never find out who these people are. But, um, but, but you know, but, but, if they if they monetize mysteryness and I cashed out too early, I'm gonna be really upset. <laughs> it's like selling out that stock when it when it was a penny stock, and then all of a sudden overnight it becomes like Apple too. And exactly. You're, you're just like, wow, I missed that and all that. So you know, um, but you know, getting back to your you know your career and everything. You know, uh, you wrote a script, and you know you began working on a screenplay on the side, and um, you know I, I, for, I you it, you mentioned the original title, I think it was Ruthless, and um, you yes. then okay good, uh, and then you know eventually you you wrote it, um, you eventually got it optioned, and then just last year it sold, and it was it's now called the Perfect Heist, so. You know, could you sort of take us, you know, through the inception of, of wanting to write a screenplay, and, and then you know, and your your idea? Yeah, the um, basically, uh, basically, my wife and I were sitting here watching Twenty Eight Days Later, and as you often do with couples, you one turns to the other generally. And in this case, she turned to me and she's like, Oh, you wouldn't leave me if the, you know, the zombies were coming. And you know, 28 days later, of course I'm going to fucking leave you. See how fast those things are. And, uh, uh, that conversation snowballed into the larger conversation of like what one would do for the other. And, 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 you know, what if you were in jail and how would I get you out? And, and uh, so this sort of idea was born, and um, I had been searching for a way out of gripping forever and just couldn't figure out what to do, where to go. And uh, so in the absence of anything better to do, I was like, well, hey, maybe I'll write the script and get really lucky and sell it. And um, that's how that cut started. <laughs> so... When you started, you know, writing your screenplay, you know, did you just basically start with, you know, a, a rough outline before you started your first draft? No, no, this uh, I just started writing um, totally in a vacuum. Like, I wonder what happens next. Like, no outline, no no cards, no nothing. Just a copy of final draft and and an opening scene. Like, I knew, and I think the opening scene never even 
made it into my final draft before I started querying uh, reps with it. But it was just sort of the, the image that I had, sort of my touchstone was was the heat L.A. gun battle scene, um, but with women. And then, like, that was just, like, that's what I want. I'm like, that's what I want to see. I'm like, I don't want to see Trinity from The Matrix, like, all painted in latex. And I'm like, I don't want to see Katie Holmes and whatever that, that bank heist movie was. I'm not going to see real women just shooting up the street. And uh, that was sort of, like, I think I listened to, I think I listened to like, two music tracks, like, the entire time I wrote the thing. And, um... But yeah, that's how I started writing it. So when you say two music tracks, do you mean like they would just play one after the other on repeat? Yep. I still <laughs> do that now. I have like certain acts. I mean, I've gotten better. Eric, uh, Eric, I'm going to butcher your last name. Eric Heiser, Heiser Ray, you know, directed hours. He's a fantastic writer. He's a great screenwriter on Twitter. If, if he's not following him, whoever's listening now, you should definitely follow him. Uh, but he turned me on to uh, Trailer Music World on YouTube, and they have all these playlists with all this like phenomenal stuff, especially if you're writing action scenes. It's just like ripped from every action movie you've ever seen, and it's just perfect. Oh, that's really cool. I'll have to check that out mm. as well. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll send you a link after the show. All right, cool. Thank you, and I'll put it in the show notes too for mm. anyone who's interested. Mm. So, um, so Calvin, so when you were writing this, where, you, you know, did you sort of, and I know you said you didn't write an outline and you were just sort of going through it, but, you know, did you, or have you since, have you ever thought about, you know, um, subscribing to one of the screenwriting, you know, ideas like either Save the Cat or Sid Field's, uh, you know, plot points or, or, you know, the sequencing method from USC. I mean, have you either thought about using those or you just, or, you know, basically I'm asking you is what are your thoughts on those? I think to steal from, um, Francis Ford Coppola in Hearts of Darkness, there's this great scene with Dennis Hopper who's all whacked out and, uh, he's like, telling Dennis, like, I need you to learn your lines so you can forget them. And I think that's my philosophy on these books. I think you can find a little something in all of them, but to adhere to them as if they're gospel is doing yourself as a writer and your script a disservice. Um, full disclosure, like, I sent my uh, script out and... Um, uh, my now manager was the only person who requested it, uh, requested it. And within that two week period, he called me two weeks later going, Hey, you know, let's talk. Uh, I was like, oh, I wrote a screenplay. I guess I should learn how to make, how to, how to write one. So I actually went and bought say the cat and I've read it. I've read story. Um, I've read a number of books. Um, I think, especially learning. I mean, I, I had no formal training, so it's like you're in a drift and you're like, well, how the fuck do I do this? So you're just sort of reading and trying to find anything. I mean, I definitely early on, like tried to make something fit, not with this first screenplay, but with the next screenplay, tried to make something fit more in line with say the cat. And it just didn't work and didn't like it. Um, but I mean, I definitely tried it because I was like just trying to figure out how to do it. And, um, so to answer your question very simply, it's, yeah, check them out. You might find something, but like, I wouldn't treat them as gospel. Gotcha. So, you know, after you did complete, you know, uh, a, a couple, maybe a rough draft or even a draft of, of, uh, of Ruthless, which was, which is the perfect case of right now. Uh, you know, did you, you, you know, did you get feedback from anybody, uh, you know, close to you or did you know, um, uh, did you go that route? My wife gave me notes, and I did have a friend who started giving me notes, but I can't remember the timeline now if she started giving me notes when it when it landed at the Bonaventura or if it was before. Um, I don't want to, like... I don't want to give the wrong information and say like, Oh, my first draft was so awesome. It like started, you know, the first draft was terrible. The draft that went out, I still to this day say it was terrible. I mean, I, I got some feedback 
Um, I'm a big proponent of getting feedback. I don't recall exactly because this now would have been 2010 and 2011 how much feedback I got before I started querying um, reps and execs. So, you know, I, just to ask, you know, just to sort of go down this route, I know you were you mentioned it on Twitter, but, you know, there's this whole thing about screenwriting consultants. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you and I, uh, I mean, I, just basically I, I touched on it when, when you sent out one tweet. Because um, I, I uh, you know, some, I mean, obviously this whole thing stems from the Script Notes podcast with Craig Mazin and it's sort of, you know, sort of trickled down, sort of, so to speak. And now, you know, I know everyone's discussing this. So just, you know, I, I feel, you know, I wanted to ask is, you know, what what are your thoughts on, on script consultants, you know, and just for those who don't know, basically it's people you pay to give you script notes. Um, I would just, just your simple answer. Your sound bite is uh, people should not pay for that service. Um, I know there's some, angrier not ang- well, angrier accounts on Twitter who are like they're all scam artists and they're all cons and that some of them are probably very nice people I know I, I was looking at your 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 earlier podcast and I uh, interviewed Danny Manis I don't know him personally but he seems like a nice guy but I mean at the end of the day he's a script consultant and um, I'm not saying any of them are trying to scam I mean some probably are but I just think they're especially with, with Twitter and Meetup and Facebook and just there's so much out there now and now um, that to pay money just seems silly to me and that's just assuming that whoever you're paying money to actually has the resume and knowledge base to to um, actually give you an answer answer worth your money you could give you notes worth that I mean, Jesus there are thousand dollars five thousand dollars I mean you could you could take an extension course at UCLA for that kind of money um, so I, I I would definitely say you know no on trip consultants um, I mean and you absolutely had to I wouldn't pay more than like a hundred bucks and really at that point you're only paying because you need notes right now because a lot of times when you're using friends or trusted readers they can't turn it around as quickly as you may need um, that being said now having been through development nothing moves that fast that you need notes that fast generally speaking. I mean, obviously, maybe one day we're like, I need to turn in on Monday, and I need I need notes, but short of that, I would only justify paying someone maybe just because you needed it really quickly. Um, but that's where I'm at with consultants. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I've heard, you know, both both opinions on, on the subject, and like you said, you know, Danny Manis was on the show. Um and again, and you know, I, I'm, my, you know, I'm not. My opinion, either way, you know, I, I, I just always want to ask the guests, you know, what, what they think of things, and you know, even going back to the screenwriting, you know, gospel, so to speak. Uh, I'm always just interested to hear people's thoughts and stuff, just on different takes. Um, of course. Because, yeah. So. You know, because you know, it goes back to even just breaking into the industry. You know, you hear you hear a lot of different opinions and such. Um, so you know, speaking of of which, um, we have a ton of questions. Um, would you mind answering a few, Calvin? Sure. Um, <laughs> I guess this count came from a friend of yours, um, and he says, "What's up with the cargo shorts?" Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's uh, John Boyer, a very talented writer, also uber douche. He knows exactly what that means. Um, cargo shorts is actually a very everyday wear for a lot of grips. Um, I can't, it's not an official set wear, but generally you'll see dudes wearing them. Um, it used to, for me, before digital everything, I used to, I would have my pockets filled with reading materials, magazines, newspapers, books, bedding slips, just everything. And uh, they're also good just to throw tools in. But yeah, it's like cargo shorts is like your uniform. <laughs> Uh, the second question is, uh, what are the, some of the stories that you have of being hazed as a grip? Um, you know, I was trying to think on that one. I didn't really 
get hazed that I recall. I mean, you know, maybe like some very minor, like go get me the left hand T stand and stuff like that. I think typically you see a lot of hazing if it's somebody who thinks they know more than they do. Um, we had we had one kid one time who just he knew it all and you couldn't tell him anything and he didn't know anything and so like the key grip made him so you have dolly track you level it with wedges and on uneven ground. And so the key grip had him number all of the wedges, which is the most asinine thing ever, but then doubled down and was like, and you, you know, had him level the track and then he stood up all proud and like, ta-da. And then the key grip like looks at them and then starts yelling at him. And he's like, this side is the even wedges, that side the odd wedges. And uh, <laughs> Kim's face melted and then, then he realized, oh, that's just bullshit. Um, no, but I didn't. I don't remember getting hazed that often. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've uh, also encountered people like that um, where they think they know everything, and um, you're like, what? <laughs> Usually, then they they either don't last too long because somebody either, you know, fires them, or somebody's just like, let's just use this guy to go get coffee or something and let them quit. Like, you know, they're too good for the for, for production. Um, that way, they can just sort of walk uh, without a lot of tears. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so uh, our next question comes in from uh, Tom Harp, and he mm-hmm. says, uh, "When you write now, do you write for production or budget, knowing what you know?" Um, not. I mean, the, the only thing that I really think of now is uh, day or night exterior. Like, if I can ever write a scene, day, I will. Um, just because I know what it means for the men and women who have to then go shoot it. Um, but I kind of, I mean, unless someone, I was given parameters, like, hey, you're going to write this movie for this company and they're known for doing $5 million movies. Like, I'm not going to then go write some $50 million visual sex bonanza. Um, so I definitely can, and I can't do, you know, a word equals $50 type equation, but I know like what it means to have a car chase through downtown Los Angeles. Um, so if I had to write the budget, I can. Um, so it's definitely a, a, a benefit to my blow line experience for sure. Cool. Um, so our next question comes in and this is, this is kind of funny, Calvin, cause this is from mystery colorist. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, so it's another mystery uh, guy. Um, so, the uh, were you actively shopping the script around, or was it encouragement from people who read it? Um, I saw that one and I didn't quite get it. I didn't quite understand the question, so I'll try and answer it best I can. Um, I uh, wrote it, and then it it took a very direct line, I think, almost to where it ended up. So once it got to my uh, my manager, it wasn't out of my hands per se, but then they did all the heavy lifting after that. Like they were shopping it around. I mean, they, well, he, he had, he called me and was like, Hey, I, I like it. It needs work, but I had someone who actually would love this script and can I give it to him? And of course I was like, oh, fuck yeah, you can. And, um, uh, so I met with them and then I developed it with David Reddy at Divano Ventura. He's at Chernin right now. Um, he's an awesome exec. If you guys ever get a chance to work with him, um, you'll be happy. Um, uh, and then once Divano Ventura and David were happy with the script, they sort of took it out and went package it and tried to package it. And then it ultimately ended up at, uh, Screen Gems. Um, so I guess the short answer is yes, it was being shopped around. <laughs> Uh, you know, just to sort of tack on my own question to that, you know, it, do you can you even talk about you know where it is in development right now? Um, so Screen Gem on the last day of the option period at the end of 2014, Screen Gems bought it, and so they have it um, uh, for you know ever unless someone wants to swoop in and buy it out from under them. Um, I actually emailed. Uh, some best uh, my guy over there, Scott Strauss, also a great exec. Um, Clint over there is also um, just a, awesome. I mean, they're just great over there. Um, but I emailed Scott and was like, "Hey, I was driving down Highland, didn't see any posters for our movie. Uh, what's up?" 
And uh, so he was just saying, oh, you know, it's a project near and dear to our heart, but, um, you know, still just waiting for the right packaging and, and uh, timing. So uh, that's where it is, sort of in development limbo. Okay. Um, you know, again, like I, I wish you the best of luck with it, but I just wanted to ask um, – but uh, but that, you know at least you know I mean it, it's great that you have such a great relationship with Screen Gems though, so because um, obviously one of my next questions after we've done these questions is what's next. So so <laughs> so uh, you know just going back to some of these questions, um, I guess this person's a friend of yours, um, Rachel Pryor. She asked, <laughs> she asked, uh, what's it like coming to screenwriting as quite an old person now. <laughs> Well, Rachel is the head of development of Big Talk um, Pictures, which is the the motion picture arm of Big Talk in the UK. Um, she's just fucking around, but I will answer that question. Uh, it's it it bums me out in a way that I didn't start this in my twenties, um, but at the same time, it's and I've, I've I've read this elsewhere, and maybe this is something old people say, but it's like I have the benefit of the life I've led up till now to inform my writing. <laughs> Um, so it's sort of like you have the, the future, the future career you may have in your twenties, but, uh, you know, you've only had 20 years worth of living. That being said, there's tons of phenomenally talented writers in their twenties and thirties. So I just have to rationalize it as best I can. <laughs> Um, she has two follow-up questions. <laughs> on on average, how many Twitter hours per day should a rookie screenwriter be working to get under their belt? <laughs> uh, they should actually be only on Twitter as it as it pertains to furthering their career, i.e., networking or. Uh, and this is a realistic answer. Like you should. I know I, I, I don't I don't do it very well, but you need to have an antisocial app on your computer and shut that shit off and you should be writing. I mean I see am writing hashtags all the time and all I'm thinking is no you're am tweeting. And uh and not to say I mean I'm guilty out I'm on it way too much, so a writer should be on as little as possible because they should be writing. Yeah, uh, the app I have is anti-social, and it's uh, it's phenomenal. And yeah. um, I, I set that and just sort of – you can set what it kills, and um, the biggest one – someone's for me. People message me through Facebook way too much, and I'm always checking that because I'm always like – there's something important that I have to see because um, it – for a variety of reasons, but like – that's why I'm just like, you know what, hell with it. I don't care, you know, if it's important, uh, you know, or how important it might be. Um, but that app is phenomenal. Uh, and yeah. Ra- Rachel has a follow-up question, and she says, finally, who is the best person you have ever met on Twitter who who can also really advance your career? <laughs> uh, gee, I wonder if it's Rachel Pryor. Um <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll go. We'll go with Rachel Pryor for the moment. Cool. Uh, I, I think she'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> I, I think there's a there's another. Yeah, um, some people are actually commenting. Um, so um, this came in from Douglas Ray, and the question is: low budget camera movement. What's the first piece of gear after the tripod any solar solo shooter should buy? More of a camera question and more of a camera operating thing, but um, a slider, a slider is always good. I mean, if you're talking about purely from uh, purely as an operator, um, where you may or may not run into trouble on that is a slider generally falls under the purview, not purview, I don't know if it's the right word, but grips more often than not carry that, dolly grips, so you might run into some, um, not jurisdictional because it's not, a union thing, but more of, hey, this is our fucking thing that we rent, not yours. Like, you do your lenses and your filters and this and that and the other. Um, I don't know. From camera standpoint, uh, filters. Filters seem to be a great rental item, and you're always going to use them. Cool. Uh, so, so um, moving on, uh, I have another question here from Vivian Ann, and she says, what do you think is the hardest part about writing a script that sells? What is it that writers continually get wrong? 
Um, well, if I could tell you exactly how to write a script that sells, I would be having this conversation from my estate in Hawaii. Um, it's, you know, it's, who's to say, I mean, there is no magic bullet on what sells. It's, I, the, in my very novice opinion, I've been asked similar questions to that and sort of write what excites the hell out of you with an awareness on the marketplace. So you may have the best zombie in the movie in the world, but you just love it. You love it, love it, love it. But there's there's 40 zombie movies out there. You you've got you've got an uphill climb ahead of you. So it's you know you can't you can't ignore. You can't ignore reality. So even though you just it's exciting the hell out of you, you still have to at least pay lip service to to, to what's there. Um, but in terms of like what's going to make it sell, it's it's that one script that lands with the right person. Um, you know, obviously some scripts are just fucking amazing, and everybody wants to buy them. Um, some scripts are very specific, only a handful. I'm just hoping that they get to that right handful. Um, uh, things that writers mistakes that they make and I'll just speak from experience um, don't read enough scripts and don't learn from that I think you should be reading always just you never know what script's gonna whether it's from a a professional, an Oscar winning script, or just a friend. You just never know what's going to hit. Either going to teach you on how to do something right or teach you how to unlearn something wrong. Just always be reading. And the other thing I would say is just constantly asking yourself, and I'm guilty of this, is but how can I make this different? How can I make this different? If it's something that I know we've seen before, how can I, at least in the slightest possible way, make this different? Um, yeah, because you, you know you hear a lot about too about the rules and about some of the rules in screenwriting about you know we see or this and that. Um, I, you know, going back to what we were talking about, you know, I, I I think a lot of screenwriters, at least what I see, my, my personally is they're they're afraid to write a screenplay. I, I'm just trying to word this correctly. That's why I'm talking a little slower. Uh, <laughs> I think they're afraid they're as you, cause you could tell Calvin, I usually talk fast. Um, but, <laughs> but you know, I think they're afraid to write a screenplay that may be seen as different. Um, if that makes any sense. And what I mean by that is, you know, I kind of go back to Shane Black when he wrote Lethal Weapon and it was just not, I mean, it was a good script, but also the way he wrote it was completely different. And I think eventually, you know, a, a gatekeeper or a screenwriter, a screenwriter, um, they're going to say, wow, you know, this was just so refreshing to read something like this. And I'm not saying to emulate the way he did it, but I'm saying, you know, the why he did it, maybe, if you know what I mean. Right. Well, the question there is, is how many scripts did you write before that? Because if that's his first script, that's ballsy fucking writing. If that's his 10th or 15th or 20th script, then that's really intelligent, smart writing. Because, uh... Mystery Creative uh, said it to me once, um, and it just really resonated. Uh, it was, um, and I don't, you know, I don't know if it's a new philosophy, but he told it to me, so I'll give him credit for it. Uh, you have to know the rules. That way you can know how and why to break them. And you see some people breaking them willy-nilly with no rhyme or reason, um, but then other people doing it very intelligently, and it's sort of again goes back to that you have to know the rules uh, and you have to know your lines and then you can forget them it's sort of once you know your basic you know your structure and your rule you, you know like I'm not a big hard and fast you can't do this and you can't do that you can't do this but it's sort of you know, if you have a few show don't tell violations okay you give it a few we see okay if it's done in the right way to really you know and at the end of the day, it's like it's a script. It's you're, at, the, at the early stages, you're writing for the reader. And that was one thing I learned along the way is like you're writing for different people in the in the process. Like right now I'm writing a spec and I'm writing that for potential readers. Uh, if it sells somewhere, then I'm writing it for potential executives. You know, is that if I survive that gauntlet at some point, I'm writing for a director. Um you're always writing for somebody else. So it's sort of keeping that in mind when you're writing and who your audience is. 
Yeah, very good, you know, very good point. Um, you know, and and this sort of is a follow up question. This comes in from Johnny Grant. Um, mm-hmm. How how often does a sale result in the writer being hired to work on said movie's development? Uh, don't quote me on this, but I'm 99% sure this is correct. Uh, if it's under WGA contract, whether you're in the WGA or not, um, a writer, uh, your lawyer, whoever, you know, if your lawyer that cuts the deal, they can write the contract such that you are given WGA protections on that specific deal. And if that is the case, WGA provides for one guaranteed rewrite at WGA minimum. Obviously, you can negotiate higher than that, or you can negotiate more steps depending on how much juice you have or how, how, uh, sought after your script was. Um, if you're non-union, then it really comes down to what you negotiate. Um, you may, you're, you're not entitled, well, you're entitled to nothing ever. It's, it always comes down to what you negotiate. Um, so yeah, there you go. Cool. Um, and the final question is, uh, do you think the years spent as a grip has tampered your writing in any way or indeed has it helped? And that's from Andrew Daniel. Uh, I think it helps. Definitely. I mean, that goes back to just being conscious of budget, um, when you need to be, um, yeah, I mean, it's in a, on a personal level, it's affected me. I mean, grips, it's a, it's a daily, it's a daily locker room beatdown. So, I mean, it's, it's helped in a way. I mean, just, you know, the worst thing I have to deal with now is, is getting a note I don't agree, agree with. Maybe whereas before I had to, um, stay up until four in the morning, standing in the rain, waiting on an actor to come out of their trailer, but they're grumpy because they don't want to, and nobody wants to be there, and everybody wishes they were dead, and then <laughs> listen to their mom and went to law school. Um, so, I mean, gripping definitely on so many levels has helped me in my writing, just in terms of perspective. Um, uh, my wife will come home and say something like, God, I've been working so hard today. <laughs> it's like I haven't put on pants in days. Like the hardest thing I had to do is figure out how to get this guy out of this car and in this restaurant and make it believable. I'm like, I don't, I write, I don't, I don't work hard. It's not to say writing is not hard. It's very hard to do well, but definitely in relative to gripping, it's easy as shit. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, and, um, I, you know, I, I I know what you mean. You know, uh, cause I have a friend of mine. He also uh, he you know when his wife comes home, uh, she actually is a nurse, and he always talks to her about like you know, like what did you do today? Oh well, you know uh, we had you know crazy people come in, you know drug junkies or whatever, um, you know, and she asked him what he did today, and he's like, well, I you know I wrote, and the tone the the printer ran out of ink, and uh, you know it's, it's one of those days, um, but you know it, it's just. Yeah, it, it's a very – it can be very lonely too being a writer because you're just in a room all day and uh, sort of just trying to you know bang something out. But um, Definitely. Yeah, I mean that's uh, – going from being surrounded by 60 people and, and uh, just the camaraderie that comes through – you know, working in ad- adverse conditions to sitting in my office alone has been a tough transition. So I, I find myself booking two and three like coffee dates a week just to get out loud. <laughs> uh, so you know, um, you know, Calvin, we've been talking for about you know uh, forty-five minutes or so now. So you know, in closing, is there you know any final thoughts that you have? Um. <laughs> Follow your dreams. No, I really, I, I, I don't. <laughs> uh, nothing that wouldn't sound, nothing you couldn't find better from one of the fortune cookie mystery accounts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, so, uh, Calvin, where can people find you out online? Uh, you can find me at Mystery Grips on Twitter. That's pretty much it. I don't ever go to Facebook anymore. Um, but yeah, Mr. Group on Twitter, there's a link to a Tumblr account. I blog occasionally. Um, there's a nice young writer started the account for me, would collect my tweets and uh, 
uh, Hector Cortez is a has a pilot, Familia, that he's check out. And then um, I took it over for him like a couple of months ago. So uh, you can always find me there. Cool. Very cool. Um, everyone, you can find me at DaveBullis.com and Twitter. It's at Dave underscore Bullis. And uh, I will, you know, make sure to link to your accounts in the in the show notes. Um, I should probably link to Rachel Pryor's account too in the show notes. I feel uh, uh, she she has had a uh, because she she has had so many questions today. And uh, uh, you, you know, she's she's I'm uh, sorry, I'm gonna cut you off. She's great. She was so I don't know if you know or when you tuned into the whole mystery thing, but she was or I guess will always be for me like mystery bread exec. <laughs> Um, she's a, a real deal executive and, uh, just, we, she actually, uh, was one of the executives on Paul, which is a movie I did, which is how we sort of came out to one another one night that we just realized like, holy shit, we worked on the same movie. Um, of course I was great and she was head of development, but, um, but yeah, she's put a lot of good stuff out on Twitter just in terms of development and writing and uh, she's, an, she's a good source of information for people I think and she's kind of fun too cool and that's kind of what it's all about you know it's got to have fun on social media exactly uh, all right, Calvin, you know, I really appreciate you coming on and um, you know I wish you the best with you know whatever your next project is thanks Dave I appreciate it anytime buddy uh, and the door's always open anytime you want to come back let me know all right, thanks, man. Anytime. Take care. All right, you too. Bye. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.